Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Jane, good to see you again. Um, always fun talking to you, Matt, and uh, and indeed, uh, it was a pleasure talking to a couple of your guys at the Kibbe Kibbutz. Yeah, the Kibbe Kibbutz, um, <laughs> otherwise known as the Free the People production team. Yes. And uh, you you are, I'm, I, I'm one to talk because I'm in Washington, D.C., but you're in the belly of the beast. You're in New York City right now, <laughs> okay. right? I just accused you of being in the belly of the beast, yeah. Matt. You're two blocks away from, from, uh, from the Supreme Court. Anyway, okay, so I'm in the belly of the beast. Yeah, I'm in Manhattan. I'm a lower Manhattanite, and indeed, I like to say, look, obviously it's a socialist city, but but there are many dimensions to it. I'm on I'm at five I'm at 55 Great Jones Street, Third Street off Third Avenue, literally around the cor corner from from where my grandfather had his used clothing store, Epstein's Clothing, new and used, bought and sold. Living with my wife Asako, we run the Soul Forum. It's filled with entrepreneurial energy uh, here, and uh, so that. That's uh, you know that's exciting and uh, and that's part of the reason why I still love New York. Been living here for over fifty years and unfortunately I, I can't leave. Yeah, and I, I I went back to New York for the first time in almost two years yeah. about a month ago and and things seemed more normal. Like, do you feel like? things are returned to normal are there yeah. still restrictions yeah. on your behavior? yeah no indeed look i mean uh, certainly i don't know I'm, I'm sorry you didn't drop by matt and say hello uh, again th i'm i'm great jones off bowery third street off third avenue it's it's filled with uh with with young people uh with a lot of energy i'm i look i'm a denizen of broadway I love broadway shows times square is filled with people and uh and so uh you it's almost like you wouldn't know that that the city was hit hit by uh by the lockdown and you wouldn't know that times square was at one point just a ghost town and uh, our neighborhood as well i've i've stayed the course i have not lived in new york city the whole time uh my wife Asako fled the city and stayed up up uh, state uh, with uh, my my stepson and his wife in new hampshire but i've been around uh continuously even through the lockdowns so we might have we might have done this last time yeah, we had sure. a conversation at yeah. pork fest i want to yeah. say two years ago but yeah. um well, a year ago so yeah, a year ago july a year ago, okay july. so yeah, yeah. for purposes of this like yeah. what i want to accomplish today you know depending on what else we want to accomplish is yeah. is is go through some basic austrian yeah. concepts austrian economics um that that might inform us given the craziness going on with the economy yeah um and apply those to to what we're what we're hearing today and what we're seeing and and like some really weird stuff going on yeah um, it's well but, yeah, 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 yeah but yes. but you're you're the best guy i could think of because oh, you're you. you're both uh schooled in in academic austrian economics but you're also a a practical guy that has spent most of your career applying economic concepts to the actual marketplace so give us cool. give us a quick version of your your resume because you were at the new york stock exchange yeah. and other places yeah, I was at, well, yeah, and picking up, I was a senior economist at the New York Stock Exchange. Prior to that, I'd been director of commodity research at a, at a major firm. And so I learned commodities. I did a lot of sort of macro stuff at the New York Stock Exchange with a cushy job that ended. And then I started, then I did 26 years at Barron's Financial Weekly covering the economy, covering the numbers. And of course, uh, the uh, I, I, should, I, I think it should be obvious enough that the difficulty of, of being both somebody trained as an author Austrian, and then trying to divine what is going on in the economy uh, from numbers that were developed often by pretty bright people, but by people who did not have an Austrian perspective. That's the difficulty. And that's the difficulty I think uh, we're going to face when we begin to talk about applying Austrian principles to what has been going on. I know the numbers very well. Uh, and I know what are good numbers and bad numbers uh, in particular, but that doesn't mean that I've got all the answers with respect to uh, where the economy is going, except uh, it's clearly headed for recession. Uh, so that anticipates where we're going to go with this. But I'd like to lay the groundwork on a couple of broad concepts uh, in order to uh, make it clear to people why I do have the Austrian perspective. So can I do that? Yes. Yeah, but uh, um, okay. let's let's go back a little bit further because I, I I don't think we talked about this last time. But okay. you were at the you were at the new school. 
I think, I oh, think yes. okay. your master's <laughs> All and, right. you, and, and you, found a, you found a copy of Murray Rothbard's yes. book. Yes, right. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. Look, uh, usually I say to people, hey, come on, you know, my intellectual journey started when I was six years old because mommy was a commie and I was a rock rib Stalinist. But uh, but OK, Matt, because you told me that time is of the essence. We've only got an hour uh, and maybe only 55 minutes left. So I better cut to where I'm at the new school. And so I was still struggling with being a socialist at that point. I was actually my career was greatly helped by the fact that I became right writing assistant and research assistant to Robert Heilbroner. Maybe you're old enough to know who he was. He was a best-selling author in economics, and he wrote me recommendations and so on. So, so I got good jo a good job on Wall Street on his recommendation because everybody had read his book, Worldly Philosophers. So, But I was a little lost intellectually. I, I, I did end up dropping out of economics in any case because I didn't like college teaching. But, but I did discover uh, Murray Rothbard's book, Man economy and state and and it really wasn't so much the fact that he was a libertarian that caught me up it was the fact that the book uh clarified so much for me about how it was possible to actually uh, espouse in economics uh, as i like to say uh the, the really the idea that or that you use the phrase austrian economics is almost a redundancy all of us think naturally in austrian terms in terms of the, of the uh, beginning with the individual the motivations of individuals and markets and indeed, even the mainstream does. And that's why every once in a while, they come up with something insightful. M um, Milton Friedman wrote this ridiculous metho methodology paper that's become notorious. They never even bothered to defend about the methodology of economics being just that, that you make decent predictions. And it doesn't matter how, how you describe things, just are your predictions accurate? It was ludicrous. And of course, Milton Friedman never actually uh, wrote that way or thought that way anyway in terms of his of his better essays and articles and insights and so uh, um that i hope uh tells you a little bit about why i was influenced by the austrian school and then because there was a bricks and mortar store called leslie for a bookshop in downtown manhattan i lived uptown i uh, went. I visited the store almost every weekend. Bought a couple of books, and over the over the years that, that ensued, uh, you know, as uh, on the side, I, I went through all the Austrians, including Friedrich Hayek, of course, Hazlitt, Rothbard, Israel Kirzner, and of course Mises. And so uh, I became schooled in econ in, uh, in Austrian economics. But meanwhile, I had the day job. Uh, I was a senior economist in the New York Stock Exchange, and I've and I covered the economy for Barrons. And sometimes in my columns which uh which ran only about eight to nine hundred words you might not know i'm an austrian because of the difficulties of covering covering the economy for you know the average person the, the investors mostly uh, at barons uh who uh, who don't know from austrian economics in any case but of course if anybody who, who steadily read me knew that i had a austrian perspective so yeah. that's hope, hopefully fills you in a little bit yeah yeah, it it does, and I, yeah. I I like the yeah. you were attracted to Austrian economics basically because it was a practical way that helped you understand the world in a way that um, neoclassical Keynesian economics just wouldn't because it's it's so mechanistic and it it pretends sure. to be it depends sure. it depends it pretends to be physics even even oh. it, it ends up being gibberish but pretends to be physics pretends to be math and on top of that the the mainstream is hobbled by a further motivation that they every they, all of them would love to many most of them would love to get out of the classroom i love 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 to get a, a, a great job at the treasury at the federal reserve uh, they all want to sit at the tables of power i exaggerate somewhat many of them want to sit at the tables of power so there too they tend to look at the economy from this top-down perspective with those two handicaps uh, it's um, it's remarkable that that many of them are still worth reading anyway because when they take off that the cloak and they try to think through what's really going on in the economy they naturally sound like austrians so in a way i i discovered that i just have to look in the in in the mirror this is the kind of economics i practiced on the side the, the austrian economics thinking rationally about how people operate in markets and what their motivation is Okay, let's uh, let's do a quick walk through. This is ridiculous, but we're going to do a quick oh, walk through okay. Menger, Hayek, Mises. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> and, and Rothbard on um, the nature of money, oh. inflation, and the business cycle, because I think those apply directly to what what we're going to talk about in practical terms. 
Okay, well, you know, well, well, the money thing is an easy one, and actually, I have a strong hobby horse with that, uh, with the with the concept of money, uh, because uh, I think Mises put it best when he when he said that money is simply a medium of exchange; it's, it's a thing that we use to, to in, instead of barter, and uh, and he said full stop. He said that the, the, the idea that money is also a store of value or that we use it to measure things and so on, that, that, that all springs from the fact that it is a medium of exchange. And Mises went a bit further and made the obvious point that when it comes to storing value, uh, it's possible, of course, to still be the proverbial French peasant and, and put money in the mattress uh, or keep your money uh, you know, in the basement the way Silas Marner in that novel did. Uh, your gold in the basement. But in, a, in an advanced industrial economy with stock markets and bond markets and ways of buying real estate through real estate investment trusts, uh, generally speaking, we store value in those investment instruments. And and uh, and I, I, I that's one of my hobby horses because it gets me a little bit tired out when the crypto people like to think, like to talk about money being a store of value. Crypto is at this point an instrument of speculation. It's not a store of value. People are speculating on the possibility that it could become money. To some small extent, it is money. But again, people do not use money. Rational people, most of us who, who have our heads screwed on right, do not use money is a story of value. So money is simply a medium of exchange. And the thing to bear in mind is that we value money. We average idiot slobs value money because of what it could buy yesterday. We, we, knew, we know that $100 could buy a certain amount yesterday. Uh, and, uh, and yesterday, we knew that $100 could buy a certain amount the day before, the day before that, and the day before that. That's why uh, we use. That's why we use dollars as money. But but then the question becomes: uh, w w If you keep going back in time, the day before that, and the day before that, you have to ask yourself: Where did it all start? And and as Mises points out, it, it had to have started with some kind of a commodity like gold or seashells. What was true on day zero when 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 there was no yesterday? And on day zero, uh, people began to use this the, this commodity that everybody valued, like gold or, or or seashells, as money. And then then of course it began to become important as money, and people then worked uh, worked with it on the basis of the day before concept. So the, the point that Mises was making is that all money must um, originate in a commodity. And that's that I think is a very deep insight. It always excited me because it's kind of a, just an inference of, of, of human nature that gives you an, a notion of history. And of course, it was properly called the regression the theorem. You regress back in time. Now, uh, partly because I, I, I was in bed with the regression theorem, it took me a while to appreciate the possibility that that cryptocurrency could sort of leech upon that and also become money. Now, of course, to pick up to to, to pick up another aspect of it, uh, which is you know why do we use dollars as money? Because those dollars evolved from gold. I, I needn't belabor that. The, the the dollar used to be tied to gold, and then government eventually severed that tie. But but still, because those dollars could have bought something yesterday and the day before that and the day before that, we use those dollars as money. And and then uh, and then the uh, the reason why gold became money is that. One of the key reasons why gold became money is because it's very difficult, very expensive to expand the supply, and and so so and and the expansion of the supply of money is something that government likes to do because government government can raise money through taxing, it can raise money through borrowing, but it's much easier to raise money for its operations by creating money. And so a government's pension for creative money causes inflation and gold or, or crypto is our defense against the debasement of money. And, and that's the reason why, by the way, we need a free market in banking, because in a competitive free market in banking, the banks will discipline 
each other. The Federal Reserve creates a monopoly whereby money creation and money expansion is underwritten by the central bank that has the power to print money. A, a free market in banking is a much better guarantee that our money that 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 our money will be will remain relatively stable, and that and that banks will not expand the money supply, will not expand the money supply through fractional reserve banking to any great extent. Uh, so I, I guess I know I've gone over a lot of points fairly quickly, and uh, uh, you maybe want to elaborate a little bit on my uh, on what I've just said. <laughs> no, that 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 was a that was a beautiful summary, oh, and okay. um, the 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 idea that inflation is caused by anything other than government expansion of the money supply is something we debate all the time. We're debating. Oh wow! Yes, well, we're, we're well, debating sure, okay. it today. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, no, indeed, and, and and you know there are little nuances to it that having to do with the cockamamie, somewhat cockamamie notion of velocity, uh, you know, which we could go into. You know, I think, by the way, Henry Hazlitt uh, wrote a book about it called Inflation, updated, I think, it was 1971. He taught me more about velocity than anybody else did uh, about the concept of velocity or the or the money to hold. But really, it's clear it's clear enough as the first approximation that that you could just resort to Milton Friedman. Well, Milton Friedman was, was again said and uh, price inflation is everywhere and always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and as he elaborated he said well you think price inflation is, is being caused by oil all the oil price is up yes the oil price is up because oil is a necessity and if oil is scarce and the price goes up we're just going to have to buy it whatever the price is but obviously that means we have less money left over to buy other things and and so the so the general array of prices is not going to rise unless the, the money supply expands. So I thought that was a cogent enough explanation. And of course, if you and I were talking with, with to some really uh, so, some real insightful monetarist technicians, they'd bring in the concept of uh, of velocity, and the Austrians would bring in the concept of money to hold. But really, those are very very incidental minor issues to belabor. The real point again is that if the, the that that the 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 price level is not going to rise unless unless the money supply expands. The price level in general is not going to rise unless the money supply expands. And we have ample evidence that that, of course, is what's happened based upon just the conventional measure of M2. We have ample measure that what happened to fuel it was that the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury, starting in February of 2020, be, 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 began to buy, be, began to push the, the tre Treasury debt up by the trillions. And, and that Treasury debt, if we just look at the official records, was taken up by the Federal Reserve through, through printed money. And that printed money and ended up in M2, which was also off the charts. A few just simple charts from standard mainstream sources would tell you what the source of the recent price inflation was. Yeah. You know, all this all this seems like common sense to me, yeah. but I yeah. am I am uh, personally surprised at the traction yeah. that mon modern monetary theory gets today. But oh I gosh. suspect yeah. I suspect it's political convenience. Um, they've they've taxed as much as they can. They borrowed as much as they can, in order to do what they've done over the last two years. Spend what is it six trillion? It's probably more. Yeah. Um, they they needed to print a lot of money. Um, yes. Is that why modern monetary theory is considered credible? And like, oh gosh, well, it's 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 alchemy, right? Like wow. we, we could just make up wealth out of nothing. Well, gosh, oh, wow. Okay, you, if you're going to start talking about MMT, which I like to call modern monetary tyranny, uh, then uh, then that, that gets into some difficult issues. The, the point is that, again, you you know, you, it was, there was, it was actually a left-wing economist, I, I don't know why I have to credit, Robert Cashman, who who quipped that in the old days, government just printed money. He said, now, now we're much more subtle. First, the government prints bonds, then it prints money. But although, of course, it, it's still conceivable that when the government uh, debt expands, it could sell that debt legitimately to people who are buying that debt. So that can happen, although it's a little bit complex. When it sells it abroad, it's probably selling that debt to other central banks in other countries. But it could it could legitimately be borrowing money, the government. But of course, we know that this time around, we, we do have data as released by the St. Louis Fed, it, the, the federal data, it's called FRED. And we, we do know, we can trace it easily the, the debt exploded and the debt held 
by the uh, by the uh, by the Federal Reserve exploded accordingly. So we know that it was picked up by the Fed. But uh, but to get to the MMTers, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they're actually filled with a certain amount of word salad. And they get sometimes you're punching a pillow with these people. Bear in mind that they will stipulate that that that, that you really don't have to finance the government through taxes or through or through legitimate sale of bonds. Uh, you, really, you don't have to do that. All you really have to do is just have the have have the government just print bonds and then sell them to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve will print the money that finances the government. And that's supposed to be a real breakthrough in thinking. But in fact, it's it's like it's old wine and new bottles because that's what the government has been doing for years. Every time it fights a war, it it it, it can it, it can sell bonds, but but most but most of those bonds are taken up by money printing. And so that's an old story. The uh, and uh, and uh, and and why do I call it monetary tyranny? Because I assume that you don't necessarily just have to be an Austrian or an individualist, or why not just be a, a you know an average liberal and say that if the government has the license to print money and not go to the people and say we we've, we've got to raise the money through taxing and borrowing legitimately uh, because because we we can't we, we can't uh, we we have no right to take the initiative and impose on you our power to print money and arrogate resources to ourselves unless we raise it legitimately through taxing and, and borrowing i try to tell them <clears throat> I try to tell, you know, capital D Democrats, isn't that offensive? Don't you think? And of course, most of them actually believe that the government does raise its money through taxing and borrowing, through legitimate borrowing and through legitimate taxing. But it's got that loophole, which is which is money printing and money and money printing is obviously tyrannical uh, for clear reasons. Now, of course, but it's OK with the MMTers because we imagine that the government is run by a bunch of prudent philosopher kings. They do stipulate, by the way, that uh, that 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 there's a danger when government does this. The danger is price inflation. And so you would have thought that the MMTers would have their tails between their legs right now because we are getting a certain amount of disturbing price inflation. And yet they are apparently are arguing, I mean, I'm not up to date on their ludicrousness, I think they're arguing that it was all because of the supply chain problems that didn't have anything to do with the money supply. I, I'm, I'm not even quite, you know, I, I've given up on these people, so yeah. I don't even know quite what they're saying now. But but in any case, that's the broad brushstroke of, of, of MMTers, that 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 uh, the money, that, that the government really doesn't have to tax and borrow. All it has to do is print money. And I, have, I actually think that some of my colleagues like Bob Murphy, they get into sort of pointless arguments with these people I would I would only just make the declaration that is tyranny. Doesn't it bother you to think that the government a government can simply print money at will anytime it wants to spend money? Isn't that disturbing to anybody, any citizen? And so that's where I like it, like it to stop and start when I deal with the MMTers. And by, and by the way, it's it's so regressive. You, you've made this point many times, <laughs> but, um, you know, expanding the money supply um, is is really a the most insidious yeah. form of wealth transfer from <laughs> from insiders to uh, yeah, away exactly. from people that actually have money in their wallet. They have money in their paycheck. Yeah. They have money in their savings yeah. accounts. And no, no, indeed, just yeah, yeah, no. It's classic. That is classic trickle down. I mean, right. there was the, you know, the 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 progressives. The progressives make fun of this bogeyman that supposedly the the free market people talk about trickle down, and and that's a whole can of worms. But but the obvious point is, but guys, you know, you, if you don't like trickle down, then you should really join us to picket the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury because they're engaging in the most blatant trickle down ever. That well. That money first hands falls into the hands of, of the banksters, and, it, and it's supposed to trickle down to us, and it's yeah, in the yeah. trillions. That's the ultimate. That's an that's that's Niagara Falls of trickle down, and you guys are allowing it to happen. Let's talk. Let's talk about the banksters and 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 how the injection points that Mises talks about, well, and, and and the the business cycle theory a little bit, well, because I, I know you don't think. That this is a classic Austrian business cycle, but just oh. to give people a frame of reference. Oh, just a moment, just a moment. No, no, no. All I said was that was that one with this. I believe that the recession occurred in 2020, and that we're out of that recession. That was a brief recession. I wrote I wrote an article called "The Great Suppression," 
and and I and I and I did it with, so to speak, invoking the authority of Murray Rothbard, because th this is an important hobby horse of mine with respect to clarifying what the Austrian business cycle is all about and why it's a plausible analysis of of of, uh, of, of why downturns happen. But Murray Rothbard specifically wrote in his book The Great Depression, his empirical study of the night of the 1920s into the 1930s. He he specifically wrote that not all economic contractions necessarily occur according to the script of the Austrian business cycle. Sometimes the king goes crazy. And, uh, and, 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 and so I, with great, I just read it. I said, my God, every once in a while, I'm pretty prescient. I made some forecasts and most of them tended, ended up being true. I said, I wrote this in, in February of, no, early March. It was published in early March. I wrote it in February of 2020. And I said that what we're in for is a great suppression. The, the, the government has gone crazy. It's locking down the economy. And so obviously that's what's going to bring uh, the huge unemployment. It, it's simply declaring that 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 50 to 50 to 60 percent of all economic activity has simply got to stop so so it's not an austrian business cycle and, and then i said that that once they lift it once they lift the clamps there will likely be a, a fairly rapid recovery uh, i stipulated well they're going to destroy certain businesses so it won't be exactly v-shaped so that's what happened then and 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 that's that's part of you know, uh, part of the point that i want to make about the western business cycle theory because in my i guess my neck of the woods so to speak i'm constantly confronting skeptics about the plausibility of the idea that 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 this one theory basically explains most, of, if not all, of the actual downturns. So here, here I, I, I pounced because I thought, well, I'm going to point out that this is indeed the great exception. Uh, that that uh, and and what I what I said, what I wrote, pretty much came true. There was a fairly rapid recovery once the government began to lift the lockdown, the lockdowns, uh, and uh, and so that that's really what it was all about. But the, but my but that said ways into my main argument which is that uh, when i hear i also hear people say a couple of things number one uh, well aren't there other other ways of disrupting the economy again let's let's hopefully they'll all they all agree and let's stipulate that that when you're talking abstract terms and we talk about an economic contraction we're really talking as as rothbard said about um, the odd convergence of bankruptcies we get we over the course of the, of the free market economy we get bankruptcies all the time but 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 uh, but but in austria but but this but the downturns that we're talking about consist of a whole lot of bankruptcies happening uh, at once that there's there so many that many many people get la laid off many many bankruptcies many many defaults happening at the same time so that we so that the conventional measures that the bureau of economic analysis pu publishes pick it up suddenly suddenly there's there's a downturn in gdp uh, gross domestic product. And and so then people ask, why are you just latching on your own particular Michigas about why this is happening? Aren't there other reasons why there could be a downturn? And I like to say, look, Rothbard already said the king could go crazy. And so that's why there could be a downturn. But then I like to ask them about various other possibilities that I fully grant. Suppose, suppose we all decided by next week, we're going to live like monks. Suppose, suppose we decided that we're going to cut our consumer spending by fifty percent. I often, I, I've often used the example of that we're all going to go kosher, but and uh, and and we're suddenly not going to eat, you know, eighty percent of the food that's produced and ninety percent of the food, that's and the kosher prices are going to go up. But that's probably a bad example. So suppose that that uh, here's another example from real life. When I was at Barron's, there was a guy named Richard Hokinson. I don't know if he's still operating. But, but he carved out a niche for him at a major uh, Wall Street firm, and he was a dem demographer. And he predicted that there was going to be a major downturn in early 1997 because there was a shortage of 25-year-olds. And I'm, I'm even forgetting, I wrote an article called Hokinson's Hokum. I, I interviewed with him, and he was surprised that I thought he was full of shit. He thought I would write it up like he knew what he was talking about. But in fact, I called it Hokinson's Hokum. The 25-year-olds would be scarce because he traced the births, the births at the time and and so there would be a big pullback in consumer spending but 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 the the whole 
point is that that entrepreneurs anticipate that. If, if you actually talk talk to retailers, that most of them are amateur demographers. They're all looking at the demographic trends. So so many of the disruptions that occur in consumer spending that, that usually happen slowly. With the demographics, it usually happens slowly anyway. But the point is that, that uh, you could be sure that if it was going to happen quickly, that there was going to be a certain fall off in a certain big segment of consumer spending, the retailers would be all over it because that's part of their plans. So therefore, most those things are not going to bring down, they're not going to cause a convergence of bankruptcies because, because business anticipates it. But here, let me get to get to almost the most ludicrous part of this, which is that I was in that article uh, on, uh, on the uh, on the Great Suppression, I quoted the Wall Street Journal of all places. The Wall Street Journal talked in a way, began to recognize in an article that was a major feature article that, that this Great Suppression was happening. But then there was this paragraph explaining the 08, 09 recession. And it said it was because of a collapse of wealth and income. It was a demand side collapse. That's what the Wall Street Journal said. And so, uh, you know, all you have to do is look at the standard national income accounts and you find that consumer spending uh, was at its peak in the second quarter of 20, 2008. Consumer spending rose through 2000, quarter, fourth quarter of 2007, real consumer spending. And, and it dipped a little bit and then it hit a new peak in, in second quarter of 2008 and that was in that was already into the second quarter of the recession that had already begun and so how could the consumer spending was rising and so they don't even bother to look it up you know that they, they i mean could they don't even bother to recognize that that you cannot find just in the conventional income account a single recession that was preceded by a decline in consumer spending consumer spending declines once the recession begins because you get massive of a massive layoffs, massive unemployment. And, and so uh, my, my, my point then is that we should indeed cooperate with these skeptics and round up the usual suspects and ask and, 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 and stipulate that there are possible disruptions that can occur uh, and th that could bring that could cause this wave of bankruptcies. But, but the one kind of disruption that seems to recur happens in the investment markets and, and happens. And then if you trace it out, it happens because of actions by the Federal Reserve. And then we get a further objection. We could put a little flesh on what that means. We, we get a further uh, objection, which is that, well, look, if you're going to argue that business is really smart and it anticipates demographic changes, then if you guys keep talking about this Austrian business cycle theory that, that, uh, that strikes, why doesn't business anticipate that one? What, what, why is this why is this one reason oh they have us dead to rights why isn't it that why can't business just you know roll with that punch why why do they all uh, over invest and there's i mean the one obvious answer to that by the way and i have my by the way i have a special answer to that the one obvious answer to that is that it's partly because most businessmen don't believe in Austrian business cycle theory. <laughs> Most of them actually thought that Ben Bernanke and Greenspan before him were actually doing fine. They 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 didn't really think that uh, that that uh, that what Bernanke that what the Federal Reserve was doing was going to cause a business cycle. That's the major reason. Most most re the retailers understand demographics, but they don't understand business business cycle theory. And by the way, that I, as I like to stress, I, I spoke to two bankers. John Allison, whom you may have heard, and, and sure. Charles Calamaris, who was a professor who also ran a bank. In their case, going into 05, 06, 07, they knew what was coming and they and they managed their banks to try to roll with that punch and they survived and so i i by the way would actually stress that that uh, that if we actually could get all all of the you know all the bankers and all the finance people uh, to read Austrian business cycle theory then maybe uh, the, 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 this this would be, wouldn't be nearly as serious when the, it wouldn't be nearly as serious a downturn when uh, when when the federal reserve does 
what it does. But the, but the additional problem is that the worst get on top. The additional problem is that the bank, in the case of the uh, 08, 09 recession uh, leading up to it, the, the, this, the banker in the starch collar who wouldn't give you the mortgage because your credit wasn't good or your, your job history wasn't good gets replaced by the casino capitalists. So, so the worst people run the economy and they look for short-term profits and many of them get away with it. And so that's the additional reason why uh, this thing keeps happening again and again. Uh, so that's that's I, I like to lay the groundwork in that sense because because you, because I'm familiar with the skeptical reaction. We, it sound it's it, it, we 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 Austrians begin to sound like like we we just have this big pension to blame everything on the Federal Reserve and blame everything on, on the banking system and uh, and and not recognize their objections. So I hopefully have addressed their objections in what I've just said. You know, it's funny because we we like to blame the Federal Reserve and how. Yeah. Um, expanding the money supply screws up relative prices yeah. and creates clusters of failures that yeah, that, yeah. that in essence is the austrian business cycle theory yeah, yeah. um but in reality you're dealing with uh, and you touched on this very early and it's it's sort of a hayek point that the worst yeah. get on top and yeah. and that yeah. um uh, economists who play the game and say that you can manipulate that it's some sort of science of of political manipulation, um, they're the guys that get hired. So you you end up with with a a self affirming set of insiders that that think no matter what happens, they they can redesign their way out of it. Sure. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, yes. And and uh, and that and of course, obviously, the worst get on top <clears throat> is a phrase that I uh, picked up from Hayek. And but although I mean, he he mentioned it in another context. But to my mind, it's it's important to stress, and I think it's a, in a point that's often missed, which is if you deal, if you look, actually look at some of the personalities uh, that uh, uh, during the uh, that 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 uh, that were part that were agents in the housing bubble that uh, that set off the 0809 recession, then you know they they they. they really were uh, the worst they really were uh, crap shooters uh, they really had no sense and in, and they do get on top because there's a lot of money to be made by operating that way uh, so yeah. I, I think that's an important point to stress as well yeah yeah that's that that i love the phrase bankster because it's yeah. uh, a bankster is someone that that plays politics as opposed to finance um, yeah and gets yeah. rich in the process at the expense of the rest of us. I, I want to I want to jump forward to yeah, today, sure. okay, um, and and throw a couple of quotes. Yeah, well. at you. There's been some interesting um, statements made. I'll start yeah. with uh, Donald Trump. Oh, uh, wow. Recent recently, he said something. It must have been on Truth because he's not allowed on Twitter anymore. But he's he said something to the effect of, um, "I shut off the economy, but then I turned it back on, as if it was a switch on the wall." And when, and when did he when did he shut it? He shut it off. When did he shut it off? I mean, he, he shut it off in uh, in February, March of twenty. Oh, oh, he oh, oh, of course. When so, when he uh, when he was president, I, and then I, I don't know when he turned it back on exactly. Um, oh, well, that's yeah, as if it was a switch on the wall. But in oh. in some ways, your great suppression. Um, you know, another way to say that is I put my boot on the neck of the small business guys by telling them that they couldn't produce things. Right. And, and then I took my boot off and they started recovering a little bit. Yes. Um, is, is that the suppression part of, of the, the, the two and a half year cycle we're going through? Oh, wow. What a question. All right. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Let me just, let me backtrack a second. The reason why I was puzzled uh, when uh, you said that Trump said he put his boot on it. In fact, uh, based upon everything I know, it was simply that Trump allowed the states to do what they want. He, he allowed what's, what's somewhat misleadingly called federalism to happen. Uh, he didn't interfere. Uh, he, uh, he was quite passive in every conceivable way, by the way, which which is truly uh, appalling. Yeah, he, uh, I mean, uh, I'm I'm obviously have mixed feelings about Florida's Ron DeSantis, but DeSantis probably would have operated differently. So he, so it really wasn't that Trump uh, did it. It was really just forty five, but basically forty five. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit. Oh because, yes, because um, yeah. Trump yeah. Trump's people, yeah, um, infamously uh, Burks and Fauci. Yeah. And okay. who's yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. third in the triumvirate? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. They um, made um, 
everybody an offer they couldn't refuse because they, they yeah. were pushing for lockdowns and yeah. and the CDC, uh, Walensky was the third one. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. They were Trump's people and he he platformed them. I don't, I don't want to pick on Trump because I well, want to, I want well, to get to picking on Biden. I, but, I know. I know. I know. Um, but okay. Yeah. But he did he did um, enable yeah um, and and provide cover for uh, state radical governors like in New yeah, York, yeah. And California, and other places. Yes, well, uh, that's true. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, although, uh, if you read uh, Scott Atlas's book, you know who Scott Scott Atlas was brought in by Trump, and uh, and Scott Atlas uh, writes a a really revealing. Uh, portrait of how he was combating these three people whom you just mentioned and uh, and how in fact uh, uh, Scott Atlas was trying to get Trump to switch course and but the three of them uh, told Trump that if he tried to undermine them they would all three resign uh, at once undermine any one of them all three of them would resign at once and Trump got intimidated by that and yeah. uh, and so so therefore he Trump Trump simply did not have the strength and resolve or the intellect to to let them resign and to cause the problems that ensued. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. But of course, I do grant your point. He he, he clearly was fostering the lockdowns, although he couldn't stop DeSantis from opening up. So so you're right. He was encouraging the lockdowns, but he wasn't, of course, decreeing them. He was just basically facilitating them through those three people. True enough. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fair. And, yeah. Yeah. But okay. Um, but you now you now now I'm I'm uh, you you want to ask me the tougher question, which is indeed look we are we we do, I, I I want to now broaden uh, try to answer your question by broadening the issue and unfortunately I guess disappointing uh, anybody who's listened to me so far. Hopefully I've had a few insights and now I'm going to say that that I I find that the official numbers, which again were not devised by Austrians, the official numbers all all. I have to go on because uh, there I, I could go on anecdotes, but obviously anecdotes have problems. And you want to go on numbers that are that are compiled broadly about what's going on in the economy. And uh, there's a, lo a lot of difficulties. I I want to backtrack one at one point and and make and and, and make this a uh, general observation, which is that we we I, I believe from the official numbers that that the most severe recessions were 74, 75, then then 81. 82, and then we had two mild recessions, uh, uh, 1991, and then 2001, and then we had the Great Depression. The, and then we had um, uh, the recession, the Great Recession, which was the worst ever since World War II. And uh, and I find that none of my Austrian colleagues, and certainly not me, can fully explain that pattern. Uh, it, it's sometimes difficult to know actually where the malinvestment is. It was fairly straightforward that in 2001, it was it was dot coms. It was a wave of bankruptcies there that, that caused the mild recession. And, and it's fairly straightforward that that the housing bubble uh, caused the 0809 recession. And that was clearly an Austrian playbook as well. Although, by the way, I bow to to those who debate the issue, who claim that the housing bubble did not have to cause as serious a recession as it did, that the Federal Reserve mishandled it in different ways. And there, there's a lot of controversy that that I can't fully settle. So when, when, when I talk about that, that I, that I have difficulty even explaining with the benefit of hindsight, the pattern of recessions going back to the mid 70s. And then and then now the, the numbers are even more confounding. And so and so the only thing that I'm fairly sure of is that we're headed for a recession. My my two of my more prominent colleagues, so to speak, David Stockman and uh, and Peter Schiff, believe that that it's self-evident that it's going to be the mother of all downturns. It's going to be the worst disaster ever. But I find that it's very difficult to say. And, and of course, with part of me, I hope that's not going to happen. It, it isn't as though I take any pleasure in in uh, in predicting a recession. I like to see good times. And, and I like to and I do think that a libertarian revolution could happen out of good times just as much as it can happen out of bad times. So but but uh, I, maybe I ducked your question completely. Well, you, you had a you had a specific question you were going to pose. So we, so we have um, it's it strikes me that 
the, yeah. this is why it's so uncertain. And I, I agree with you. I, I don't know exactly what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I can point well, to some. Well, recession is going to happen. I, I believe that. Sure. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but to- like, um, I, I think that the last two and a half years have done yes. such structural damage to the yeah. economy that yeah. it is, I think it's going to be a doozy. And I hope yeah. you're, I hope the rosy scenario is the true scenario. But, but you had like, I don't think there's a, there's a historical precedent for just shutting down the economy yeah. and, and breaking all of these supply chains the way that, that we did in 2020. Well, so the, they, 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 you don't, you don't think that I mean, there's some evidence that they're getting repaired and the supply sure. chains. That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, oddly enough, I guess, I guess we have a reverse viewpoint because, uh, because I see, you know, because, you know, I ran the Soho Forum. We're going to have a couple of minutes for me to plug my Soho Forum. Sure. And of course, I suffered as a small businessman through the Soho Forum, but my Soho Forum is now flourishing again. So, so look at all that entrepreneurial energy that came from Gene Epstein. You know, yeah. that they didn't destroy me. You know, I I lost a lot of business. We I I, I brought the Soho Forum. Okay, I, I brought it back in September of last year when they were still imposing mask requirements, and then they weren't. And and the, the audiences were like you know less than one half of what they used to be. But we're building them back. Uh, and uh, and so and then New York City has come back. So you know so again I'd like to try to say to many of my Austrian colleagues that that there's other, there's this other thing going. I, I'll, I'll tell you one interesting story with you which you might. I'd like I used to interview Milton Friedman. I called him up like you know three or four times a year, and uh, and we had chats about this and that and so on. And uh, and and then of course when I asked him about Austrian business cycle theory, he thought he had the decisive. Now this was what this is Milton Friedman not thinking the, like an Austrian, but thinking like a macro guy. He said, "Now wouldn't you expect that that the strength of an expansion would be symmetrical with the with, with, with the severity of a collapse?" That wouldn't that be what you'd look for in order to verify Austrian business cycle theory? And he said, but you don't find that at all. And he thought he thought he just he just that that was the end of the argument. He thought that that he'd just proven that Austrian business cycle theory couldn't be valid. So I said politely, Dr. Friedman, that to begin with, there might be some measurement problems anyway with the strength of an expansion, strength of a collapse, but more to the point and more decisively, there are always healthy aspects of an expansion. There, there is a lot of entrepreneurial energy still in this U.S. economy, still in our society. So, so an expansion that's that's measured by the official measures that looks strong, maybe a lot of it was healthy. And so that so if a lot of it was healthy, that doesn't necessarily mean that that a that a strong expansion expansion is going to lead to a sudden collapse. So therefore, I don't think you've just, ref- I don't think you've refuted Western business cycle theory on the basis of that analysis. And so I pointed that out to him. And then I want to point out to you that 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 the unseen thing is the strength of the SOA forum. It's come back. I, I I see restaurants that come back, that have come back. You know, they they, they kicked us in the butt. We were on our asses. But we came back, you know, and so uh, so you you're saying, well, the the Great Suppression they destroyed all that, but maybe you don't appreciate the Gene Epstein's of this world, the entrepreneurial energy it, that's it, manifest. It 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 broke the supply chain, and okay, it broke, the, it but not irreparably. Not irreparable. Well, nothing is irreparable, and well, I, I I generally have been um, surprised and inspired by the resilience of free people to fix the most incredibly messed up things that government yes. does to us. And okay. I think, I think this is the most messed up thing I've seen in my lifetime. So you yeah. see so lockdowns, a lot of businesses are prohibited from performing. Um, they pour $6 trillion onto the economy, part of which is paying people not to work. Precisely. Um, yes. And of course we now have a uh, pretty, pretty substantial inflation and we have these weird anom- in the, uh, anomalies in the labor market yeah. that you pointed out on Twitter, yeah. I think, yeah. this morning. So, yeah, yeah. so you have, um, in the face of all that, and this is what I want you to address, Okay, you have the Biden administration saying, one, that his spokesperson said, this is the strongest economy in history, and Biden saying, zero inflation. And of course, I don't think those things are true. But but bring it all together. This okay. is why I'm calling it a perfect well, storm, because it's it's not just lockdowns. It's not just supply chain disruptions. It's all of this free money that is being fi- financed by by the Fed printing money. And on top of that, government keeps helping. And and that to me 
makes yeah. it very difficult for entre entrepreneurs like you yeah. to, to fix it. Yes. Okay. You, what you said could be correct in terms of a forecast. Uh, and I, I, uh, I, I will not be surprised either way. Uh, will this be a recession similar to 1991 and 2001? Will this be a worse recession than uh, even 08, 09? Uh, uh, I think both things are possible. Uh, you can make arguments on both sides. Uh, but although, let me address what you've just said. Obviously, this is not a very strong economy. Uh, you know, I mean, Paul Krugman, who, of course, can be relied on to, to, get, to give you misleading data, no matter what, pointed out that that in the first, what, uh, you know, first year and a half of Biden, we had faster growth in employment than we had in the first year and a half under Trump. But of course, what that's part of what I've been arguing which is that we did have a fairly rapid uh, uh, recovery because once the lockdown stopped and, and people resumed, then employment began to rise, even though, as you point out, of course, there, were, there was huge disincentives to work. And only, only on, the ba on, on the basis of the most recent numbers uh, from, from the non-farm payroll employment, the establishment survey, we are only now back to the peak in terms of employment that we were in February of 2020. So, so we finally clammed back to that peak. That's, that's, that's not, we're not even at the expansion phase of, of employment. So, but it, it was fairly rapid in terms of the numbers, but, but we're just back at that peak. Although I do regard that as a bit of an achievement, although, although just to make things interesting, if you actually look at what's called the household survey, which, which, is, which, which tracks the unemployment rate, but which also has a figure for employment, the household survey says we're not back at that peak. And by the way, that, that's by the way, that, by the way, resolves the, the, the point that was the question raised by Jeff Tucker and others. How is it that fewer people are working and yet, and yet, we're, and yet we're, we're back at the peak of employment? Well, the fact is that fewer people are working in terms of the household survey. The establishment survey is a little different, uh, and, it, and it says we are back at the peak. So the household survey and the establishment survey are disagreeing, although the household survey does show some a, a great deal of progress as well. But in both cases, the progress is heartening, but we, but we are either back at the peak or we're not back at the peak. So this was not a very, uh, this was not the, 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 what you say, the most rapid economy, the fastest growing economy. This is simply a rebound from, from the past. And it's a rebound that I predicted. So therefore I'm gonna claim credit for it. I said that, just, that, that it could be hobbled by government issuing money to people to get them not to work. It could be hobbled because because some of these businesses are never going to come back. My my wife, but here here you again you're talking to an entrepreneur. My wife owns a, a rental building on Five Bleecker Street. Uh, the restaurant that was there couldn't make a go of it, but we've got a new restaurant there. These two young guys who who have every hopes, who have uh, just working day and night to get that restaurant off the ground. And so so the, so if, uh, to the extent that the numbers are picked up, the the restaurant that dis that briefly disappeared at Five Bleecker Street is back in business. Uh, so what do I believe at that point? I'm only saying then that that. Uh, that I believe that capitalism, the free market, even though it it's hobbled in many ways, don't estimate the energy. I think that that, that indeed the, the supply chains are being fixed. People do cope. There are workarounds. I would even say, by the way, that, that I, I tweeted this morning something that I was predicting. Again, I'm not claiming to be much of a prognosticator. I'm bragging a lot today about my prediction. But but I said, look, the Russians are going to find a way to sell their oil. The, 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 you, you can't prevent oil from going to the marketplace. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be, they're going to find workarounds, you know, so, so, so the West will not buy their oil. So, so they'll, so the, the Russians, as there was an article in the Wall Street Journal this morning, and I, and I, and I, uh, I, I highlighted the, 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 the Indian companies are buying, are buying immense amounts of Russian oil. The Chinese are picking it up. You know, you've got oil to sell. We want to buy it because oil, oil is an extreme, it's black gold. And, and so they'll find workarounds, you know, and they did. You know, the, the, the Russian economy is, is not suffering. The price of oil is 100 bucks. They're making more money from selling oil than they did a year ago. So, again, 
all of those anecdotes show that the, that you can't underestimate the resilience uh, of of the world economy of the entrepreneurial economy. With that said, we 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 have we had a certain amount of fluttering. We have in terms of the official measurements. GDP showed two quarters in a row of, uh, of, of a contraction, mild contraction, first quarter and second quarter, but gross domestic income, uh, which is another measure of broad output, actually increased somewhat. The average of the two is, so we, we, I don't even know if we're technically even in a recession yet. And so it's all pretty ambiguous. So uh, I, I, I mean, maybe push me, maybe I can say a few more things, but unfortunately uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to disappoint. You could be right, you're predicting, we'll see who's right. Uh, you hope I'm gonna be, you're predicting a severe downturn, uh, worse than the 08, 09, given all of those problems, given, look, the immense amount well, why is why are you why could you be right because of what david stockman and peter schiff like to point to just look at look at what the federal reserve was doing maintaining the, the fed funds rate at, at zero percent look, look at all that accumulate look at look at all the malinvestment that could be occurring and by the way I do see, I, I do have two measures. One of the measures that just based upon conventional measures, uh, conventional measures are, of course, the price earnings ratio in the stock market. The stock market did hit an insupportable price earnings ratio. And so that, 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 that indicated that it was going to peak and we, and we are now the beginnings of a bear market. The other one I look at is the house to rent ratio. Uh, I can take the house price, a, a measure of the house price that goes back actually to the 50s, and I can take that component of the consumer price index that tracks rents, and I can create a ratio. So so the house price rent ratio, uh, if if you think about it, it should it should be, you know, the, the choice of renting or the choice of owning should should have a certain relationship to each other. And, and if the price of houses goes up way too high in terms of the rents, then and you're looking as you were in in uh, 05 and 06 you're looking at a housing bubble the, the house price rate, rent ratio is is higher than ever and so it indicates a certain bubble condition in the housing market so so that i can say and so clearly we have the makings of a recession we have the makings of a downturn and i won't be surprised either way and by the way being a mild recession a recession that that's painful but but not as severe as 0809 or you could be right and it could be worse than 0809 in terms well, of unemployment and general pain yeah, yeah. Well, i am not a pro prognosticator at all and, okay uh, well but you made a prediction so please I, with the bullshit. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping, by the way, that you're right and I'm wrong. I know, I know. Um, Look, I'm hoping. Well, excuse me, excuse me. I didn't say I'm predicting a mild recession. I, I said, I said that I'm. I think it's. Stupid. I think it's fully documented right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me go on record and say that I will not be surprised if you're right. If, if because because I look, I can see evidence for it just on the basis of of what Stockman and Schiff like to say, both of whom are stopped clocks, <laughs> both both of whom are predicting uh, that that collapse will be just around the corner for the last fifteen years. Right, uh, right. By, by the way, and uh, they, I'm not hurting. You know, they're still making Stockman is still a multimillionaire, and Schiff will still be raking it in, even though I've insulted them. I wish they'd stop their stopped clock routines because they give us uh, Austrian a free market e economists a bad reputation uh, and uh, but uh, the point is but obviously they have a point just on the basis of the fed funds rate being at zero to zero percent of all of all that accumulation of money uh, it it's clearly clearly just as signals malinvestment occurring in different parts of the economy that could be pretty severe now that the uh, the federal reserve is aggressively raising interest rates yeah so you, you've, you've teased my last question. I okay. love to ask this question. I yeah. asked it a lot yeah. in 2008. Yeah. Um, what would Mises do? Oh my God, what would Mises do? <laughs> like Dude. today, we, we just described how we got here and we're, we're sort of speculating as to how this might work out. And and we're, we're leaning on entrepreneurs and the American spirit to, to lift us out of what? the tremendous mess that the government has created. Yeah. Um, what would what would Mises advise Joe Biden if if uh, he called him up and said, Ludwig, what oh, should wow. I do? Oh, oh, OK. Well, that's an easier question. Okay. <laughs> 
and and I, and obviously and obviously we, we assume we assume Joe Biden has the capacity to listen to Mises and uh, you know and and uh, and Mises Mises is not going to soft sell him because that's Mises you know Mises yeah. was still holding on to his rent stabilized apartment but uh, because he needed it for security he was earning chump change uh, but he's going to well obviously what he's going to tell Biden is that that clearly uh, all that we're really talking about uh, and uh, this is what Hayek would have said too pretty much uh, all that we're really facing is a wave of bankruptcies in the private economy it's it and bankruptcies happen all the time in the economy it's just that there's going to be a huge concentration of bankruptcies in the private economy and so yeah and and, and the way to heal it uh, the way to deal with it is to let the bankruptcies happen as awful as that is. It's going to be painful to watch, but but you have to allow the free market to sort these things out. People are going to be laid off. Businesses are going to go bankrupt, but you need to allow a reorientation toward, uh, toward sustainable businesses that the free market will ultimately find. And then he's going to say, look up what happened in uh, what famously in 1921 when, when the government did not nothing and uh and, the, and it looked like a very severe downturn but the free market sorted it out but because anything else you do in in order to uh, stave off these bankruptcies is going to be counterproductive because you've got this model in your mind that 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 we're, that we're down and so you want to make it you know you want to sort of shore up those things that are down and you don't realize it's malinvestment it's mistakes it's errors that were made and 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 of course errors are made all the time and we don't and we think nothing of it. You know, this this guy had a restaurant. It didn't work out. He he was trying to sell uh, you know frogs legs to to kosher people, and and so he's got to shut it down. He's laying people off. Well, what are those people going to do? Well, they'll get a job in some other restaurant. They'll do something else for a living, and that's pretty much what you have to do, President Biden, is what Mises would say. Uh, let it happen, and it could solve itself fairly quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let let uh, let the economy heal. Let free people. Um, figure things out. Let yeah. entrepreneurs anticipate the future. Exactly, and, and, and of, of course, you you now uh, you know you now you know. I guess I've passed my time, but you now prompt me to point out that the same lesson applied, of course, to the lockdowners, to COVID. You know, exactly the same thing. We we don't we want we allow people to, uh, to protect themselves, to figure it out on themselves. You will have uh, herd immunity, which I I think actually did occur. You know, the same philosophy applied, and the same not philosophy, the same rational. Uh, advice applied to COVID as well. Yeah, and, and I get this from the Austrians uh, that ultimately the market is just the process of people trying to figure things out. Yeah, and Try cooperating and imagining the future and and coming up with solutions. And yeah. and what we what we didn't allow during COVID was that process. What we haven't allowed since then is that process. And my my fear, my pessimism comes from. Yeah, um, Joe oh. Biden's not going to listen to Ludwig von Mises advice. Oh. He's going to keep helping. He's probably going to start propping up um, does, does, failure does he... and, and let all that never let um, people yeah. heal the economy. And that's yeah. that's my concern. But but we are running out of time. Okay, and sure. uh, yeah. I promised you um, a chance to shamelessly oh. plug the Soho <laughs> Forum. And I didn't I didn't know that you were a suffer, suffering entrepreneur. So I, I feel oh. like I really need to let you do this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I've, I've tugged you to heartstrings, Matt, and 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 uh, and turned you into a generous guy. Even though I happen to know you're an extremely generous guy, anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, my, well, my 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 soul form has. Uh, we have got five debates coming up. Uh, the the one on uh, September 19th is the next one. Well, will this be aired before September 19th? Do you think? Uh, yeah. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Uh, plug oh. away. Okay, it won't. Oh okay. yes, I'm sorry, I answered oh. it wrong. It 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 will it'll appear before that. So oh, okay, away. yeah. Well then, uh, if uh, September 19th, we're going to be, be debating uh, the the resolution. It is imperative imperative to abolish nuclear weapons. And a guy I've been a big fan of, Ward Wilson, who wrote a really great book called The Five Myths of Nuclear Weapons that I recommend to everybody. One of the chapters is on the myth that Japan surrendered because of nuclear weapons. Another chapter is on how close we came to nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. 
And so he's he's been a big arguer for uh, abolishing nuclear weapons. And so he's going to have a worthy opponent that's September 19th. In October, I'm actually going to be debating uh, a uh, principal editorial writer for the New York Times who writes about economics for the New York Times, Benjamin Applebaum. Uh, and uh, he's going to be defending a particular resolution having to do with his book. Uh, so that will be me against Binya. In November, I will have Jay Bhattacharya. You, you did, you did, can I give you the award, Matt? Jay is a great, Jay Bhattacharya is a great interview. He does a great job no matter who interviews him. You did the best interview with him because you you uh, you had him answer a whole lot of sort of libertarian oriented questions that he dealt with. And I think a lot of great wisdom came from it. But And, and I believe by the way that Jay is clearly the, by far the best guy. If you want a guy arguing about the lockdowns, I think in terms of perspective and insight, uh, uh, there are many gr very good people out there who have learned a lot from, but I think Jay Bhattacharya is the best. So he's coming to, in November uh, to debate uh, lockdowns against a worthy opponent from Harvard. Uh, in December and Jan in January, by the way, I'm going to have Larry White of George Mason uh, uh, finally coming to the fore to defend the idea that the Federal Reserve should be abolished. Uh, and then actually in February I haven't that set that up yet but but I have I have the uh, debate pretty much set on one side of the argument uh, a, an argument for the efficacy of a national divorce of uh, secession uh, in December we're going to debate nationalism uh, anyway nationalism that's going to be defended by by Rich Lowry uh, editor in chief of National Review he's going mm. to defend the idea of nationalism and wow. uh, we like conservatives uh, against a libertarian so uh, that's our debates but so if you go on the soulform.org you can see all those debates listed you can buy tickets afterwards there's a party at my place just two blocks uptown uh and uh, I enjoy them we look again uh, you know if you want to believe in the you 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 should come one of those dates, Matt. Come to Manhattan, walk around. I'll escort you. Come to the party. Uh, you, you'll uh, you'll feel all the energy. Uh, uh, what has happened is we we the 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 place where we used to have our debates uh, went out of business. So we're now down the street at the Sheen Center, and uh, the Sheen Center really doesn't have space for the for the after party. But since my loft apartment is only two blocks uptown, my dear wife Asako puts up with it and caters the parties, and we can fit about 120 people into our loft. And so uh, it's a big uh, big space, and so uh, we have the after parties and. If you Usually the, the the debaters come to the parties, and then uh, imminently we're going we're going to release the debate we had on climate change between uh, Stephen Coonan and Andrew Dessler. This was just a, a two weeks ago. We had a problem getting it out because of one of the one one of our reason people was sick with COVID. Reason uh, Reason Foundation actually puts out the videos, and that key person was sick with COVID for a long time. So we haven't been able to release it, but hopefully in a day or two we will. But if you go on the so forum.org you can get all this information uh and uh, and then if you hit the donate button you can help out a starving entrepreneur like me yeah we, we got to prove to the world that entrepreneurs can in fact survive even the stupidest of government policies yes exactly <laughs> and okay. you do that by donating to the soul forum and coming to our debates Okay, Gene, I, I will, um, you know, I've never been to a Soho forum, so oh, I'm wow. going I'm going to commit to you. Oh, my wife, Terry, is sitting over here well, okay. telling me that Terry has been there. Oh. Um, but I, I commit to uh, um, entering the hellscape that is New York to go to your event sometime this year, hopefully multiple times this year. Wonderful. And I, I want to thank you so much for doing this, and uh, let's talk again. A pleasure as always. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.